make make a crop and see if uh, something goes on. Make some sound. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so we are still on the road. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so during my presentation, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you some ways to look into the text uh, of the Gaussian of an Gaussian output file uh, and extract some important information contained in that file. So uh, Gaussian Gaussian writes okay. Gaussian writes its uh, writes its output file to a file called a log file, and it has the same name as uh, the input file, but the but with the lo dot log of extension, and it contains a lot of different import important information uh, in that file. So in this presentation, I'm going to explain how to extract total energy, uh, and how to calculate band gap, and how to approximate ionization energy and electron affinity uh, using uh, that log output file. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, uh, an example molecule, uh, 135 uh, hexa uh, hexatriene molecule, and I already I performed a single point energy calculation using that molecule uh, uh, for an already optimized structure uh, using hard fork method. Okay, so so I I don't have the molecule uh, right now. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, first of all, how to uh, view or how to open a text file or an output file uh, in uh, Linux command line interface? We can use a more command to open a text file or an output file uh, in, in Linux command line interface. So we have to just type uh, more and then the name of the output log file. So we can open the log, uh, log file and we can uh, scroll through this file uh, using this more command. Okay. So this is the log file and then uh, the total energy, how to extract total energy uh, from this log file. Uh, so the total, so this equation gives the, uh, this equation gives the total energy. Uh, of a molecule uh, according to hartree fock theory and uh, this uh, uh, this part of the equation uh, represent the uh, electron nuclear interactions and this part uh, for <laughs> okay so this part uh, represent the electron nuclear interaction and this part uh, for electron electron interaction so to extract the total energy from uh, from this log file we can use this scf done keyword so first we have to open the log file and then uh, we can search for this keyword SCF done uh, to search a keyword we can use this backslash uh, symbol so we have to type backslash then uh, the keyword SCF done and we can press enter we can find out the total energy of this molecule okay so there is another simple method to find out the total energy we can use uh, this command line uh, the uh, GREP command and then this SCF done uh, keyword and the name of the log file so we can uh, find out the total energy without even opening the output log file. So next I am going to explain how to calculate band gap. So the band gap is, uh, is the energy difference between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So in order to find out the band gap we should know the orbital energies of this particular molecule. So uh, to extract uh, the orbital energies uh, we can use this keyword eigenvalues. We have to just I type the backslash and then the eigenvalues keyword so then we can find out the orbital energies of this molecule so here we have the highest occupied molecular orbital alpha occupied this is the highest occupied molecular orbital and uh, this this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital so we know the energy of the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals we can take the difference and calculate the uh, calculate the band gap of this particular molecule so then uh, we can uh, use the Koopman's theorem to approximate the electron and uh, electron affinity and ionization energy of a particular molecule. So this equation gives the total energy of a molecule, and then according to Koopman's theorem, uh, if we neglect the, this electron-electron interaction term, uh, we can approximate the total energy of a molecule to sum of the all occupied orbital energies. So then we can uh, define uh, total energy of a neutral molecule by this equation and for an anion we have one extra, extra electron than the neutral ion so we have a one excess electron so this is this expression uh, represent the total energy of an anion uh, likewise for an cation we have one le uh, one less electron than the uh, neutral ion so 
then uh, to calculate ionization the ionization energy is energy uh, energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom so uh, in another way the ionization energy can be defined as the energy difference between the cation and the neutral ion so it will be equal to the negative energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital so here we have the uh, orbital energies of of these molecular orbitals and then uh, this is the highest occupied molecular orbital then we can approximate this uh, ionization energy of this molecule uh, and the ionization energy of this molecule is equal to the negative energy of this highest occupied molecular orbital so uh, for electron affinity electron affinity is the energy required to abstract an electron to form a negative ion so uh, in another way the electron energy can be defined as the energy difference between the neutral ion and the anion so it will be equal to the energy of the lowest occupied molecular orbital so this is the energy of the lowest occupied molecular orbital and we can approximate the electron affinity using this uh, the mass theorem so that's it thank you very much okay let's thank you and any questions you always wanted to ask to Koopman or to Tion? <laughs> uh, I do have one, and you can think and generate. So, uh, how would this um, set of orbitals, how would the output file of Gaussian change if you request calculation of a triplet configuration? What would change immediately? What would, how would you... What so would depend, you see? Uh, depending on the spin state, uh, mm -hmm. it will have two sets of uh, occupied and unoccupied molecular orbitals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Tivan once again. And uh, the next presenter is uh, Zach Gerards, who will give a surprise presentation that we completely missed in the labs and lectures, the symmetry of molecules, how it is implemented in Gaussian software. Okay. I'm Zach. All right, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some molecular symmetry applications for Gaussian and Gauss view. Um, but first, we need to kind of get an understanding of what is molecular symmetry. So symmetry is simply uh, an indistinguishable representation of an object in space upon the action of a symmetry operation. So when you apply this to molecules, it's molecular symmetry. Now, what are these symmetry operations? Well, there's five of them. One, there is the molecule itself, and the matrix uh, representations are there in lieu of actually having some three-dimensional figure to show you. Uh, the other one is a rotation, which is determined by uh, 2 pi over n, where n is an integer number, so this is in radians, right? Uh, matrix representation. Third, reflection. Uh, fourth, inversion. And then the fifth one is really a product of two operations, where you have rotation and um, the reflection. Okay, so... How do we characterize uh, molecules by their symmetries? We do this by point groups. And so this is a nice little flow chart uh, that shows an algorithmic way to uh, assign point groups for different molecules. I'm not going to go through it because we don't have time. But notice uh, the DNH group here is, I'm going to show a molecule that falls into that point group. Uh, more or so for Completion, I'm not really going to go over this, but this is a character table. What character tables are is they are complete representations of a point group symmetry in tabular slash matrix form. And so uh, the reason I show this is, one, this is the table that people who use group theory to look at molecules can predict molecular um, characteristics or behaviors. And also on this kind of list here, uh, some of you may have noticed some of the functions in your output logs, they actually have these molecule symbols by them. This is where they come from, is they come from the character tables that corresponds to the point group of the molecule of interest. Um, they have meaning, but we don't have time to go over it, unless you want to take group theory, which I suggest some of you should. Okay, uh, yes, now let's go to the actual practical aspect of applying symmetry to the Gauss view. So, very quickly, uh, we start with our benzene molecule, and to get to the point group uh, dialog box, go to edit, point group. Then 
what you need to do is enable group point or point group symmetry. It's disabled uh, uh, by default. And so what are some of the things one can do? Well, you can constrain your point group or your molecule to a point group. So I chose benzene. It is as it is, uh, D6H is what its point group is, though the default is always C1, which is virtually no symmetry, is what the, that point group means. So if I constrain it, and if I want to perform some uh, operation on it, like changing the bond length, since I constrained it to that point group, it will change the bond lengths for everything, even though I just specified two atoms, in order to maintain the point group. Okay. Uh, so now what happens if I have a slightly disordered molecule, or one that is not uh, optimized for its predicted uh, symmetry? So I started with a uh, benzene molecule that is slightly elongated along, uh, or a bond. And so if you go back to the dialog box, you want to set your tolerance. When you set your tolerance, you increase the, um, really the deviation of the molecule as it is to what it could be. So the greater the tolerance, the higher order point groups you have allowed to you. And so I want to get this to D6H. I select 1.0. Do I feel lucky? Never. But so I can click on this uh, drop down menu, which will list the higher order um, point groups. Select D6H, since this is benzene. That's what it is. Click symmetrize. Oh, hey, would you look at that? We are now uh, symmetric. OK. Um, so how does this apply to things like doing jobs and calculations? Well, if you go to the Calculate dialog box and click on the General tab, you have this little checkbox where you can actually ignore symmetry. So by default, it's unchecked. So every calculation you guys have ever done so far in class, symmetry has been accounted for. However, if you don't, what happens? Well, this is maybe not very impressive, but the, the, the conclusion's still the same. So. I just did the uh, total energy calculation using hartree fock for benzene, the 321G uh, basis set. So with no symmetry um, considered, the calculation took 1.8 seconds. With symmetry, it took 1.5. Once again, not very impressive. However, if one were to do a more rigorous computation, this would become uh, more useful. What's kind of happening, though, in the background is that if you look at the log file, you, what's being generated are symmetry adapted basis functions instead of just the basis function that you initialized with. So what that means is that if your molecule has symmetry, it will more or less reduce its basis set and then project or perform the operation on the smaller basis set and then project that calculation uh, for the rest of the molecule, assuming that it is symmetric. So. Conclusions, you can optimize geometry, not so much bond lengths, more with bond angles, and reduce job time while maintaining accuracy. Good thing, Zach. For squeezing group theory course in uh, five minutes. <laughs> Any questions to the group theory and its implementation in uh, Gaussian and Gaussian? Okay, let's uh, scroll to the very beginning. I, I will have a question. Okay. At the beginning, you did have the Milken symbols. Yes. And they all have subscripts. Yes. So uh, subscripts are either U or G. Mm -hmm. what, what are those? Gerade and ungerade. Which means? Ah, so it means if there's a center of inversion or if there's no center of inversion. How do you translate it in uh, English? <laughs> so. To go back to the initial slide, one of our symmetry operations is an inversion center, right? So if we actually go to the uh, matrix representation, if you go through the molecule straight down through the, on the other side, you should have an identical atom on the other side of that inversion center, right? So gerade means there is one, und gerade means there is no identical atom on that other side. Okay, so even in order. That works too. <laughs> <laughs> Last chance. If no, let's thank Zach once again. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Whitney Ong. Uh, please uh, come and set up your presentation. So she will tell a story of, um, she will instruct us what to do if the molecule of consideration has too many orbitals but we still want to look at them and characterize them in uh, 
in average. How to visualize and represent so many orbitals at once? What is yours? Yes. Uh, so hi, I'm Whitney. I'll be talking about how to get all of your density states uh, and represent them into a graph. Um, how to generate a graph, Aaron will talk about it later. So um, let's go through with um, what, how, what's the density of states mean. So in general, density of states um, is the system that de describes the number of states per interval energy at the each energy level that are available to be accepted by, occupied by electrons. Um, a high density of states at a specific energy level means that there are more states available for occupation of uh, electrons. So um, the script is here. Uh, Perl is just to find where the script is. The bin is where uh, the place where you keep your script. And then the Gauss, Gap, and DOS version 2.pl is the script name. And then put your file. You have to put a space after that, and then um, your file name, out, uh, output file name, and then you put your number of steps, the bandwidth, uh, how many electron volts down from the HOMO, and how many electron volts up from the LUMO. So these are the variables that you can use. So usually, um, steps in calculations are, I use 1,000. Um, bandwidth, you can use anywhere from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 electron volt. Uh, and then if you put like, um, for example, if I put five electron volts, then it will calculate from the HOMO, five electron volts, it will just show in a graph, five, only five. If you put 10, then you will show more. Same goes for the LUMO. Five from where your LUMO starts and goes. This, um, this plot is not normalized. You can normalize it, but it's a different kind of script, I guess. So for example, if you insert this into your command window, um, that will be your output file name and dot log, which is your output file extension. And then 1000 will be the steps, and 0 0.1 will be your bandwidth. 5 would be down from your homo, and five will be up from your LUMO. And then this thing will be generated. So, um, and then you can see that, you can see, you can make sure that, okay, what's your output file name? What's your energy steps? What's your bandwidth? And you can see whatever you have input into this command. And from that, you can also look at your um, Homo energy level in electron volts and LUMO energy level and energy in electron volts here. And you can also look at the gap between them without having to calculate it manually. The computer does it for you, which is over here. Yeah. And you, so you can also look at the gap center, where it, the, the real gap center in uh, electron volts. I think that's it. Any questions? Okay, let's thank uh, Vicky for the presentation. And any questions about density of states? Um, can you s scroll to the image? Uh, would you please show on the image where is the homo, where is the lumo, and what is the gap? This is the homo, this is the lumo. And the gap is between here and here, which is about 15, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is the molecule that you are presenting with this density of states? Honestly, I don't remember. Huh? One of, <laughs> I took one of the one in homework. Uh, can, can you scroll to the last page? No, it's different. It, I use no? it different. Yeah, no? it's different. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take it differently. So what's the difference between states and orbitals? <laughs> Try what, what do you think? State can be ground state and excited state, right? Okay. Orbital is just. I don't know. Yes, yes. That's right. So, 
The only reason I'm asking is because we call that diagram density of states, but really those are molecular orbitals. We are exactly. At. It's density of energies of molecular orbitals. Yes. The states are more general as those are straighter determinants for ground or yep. excited states. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Oh. Third and question. Thank you. If you integrate your DAS, what does that give you? Integrate? Yes. I if you do not know uh, the question. answer, you need to attack back and ask, define what does it mean integrate? Yeah, what does integration <laughs> mean? So you find the area under the curve of your DAS using this script. Okay. What does that give you? Um, because you said it's not normalized. Yeah. Yeah, this is not normalized, the one that I show. How, how, does, how do you get your spectra? I run the script. How does the script? There, there are no spectra. Oh, the dots. How do you get your line? From the output file? You, you dress <laughs> each state with uh, Gaussian. Correct. Okay. And I'm assuming it is a normalized Gaussian. Is that correct? Uh, ask, answer him what you expect to be uh, summation or integration under the curve if the density of states is normalized. I honestly still don't understand what he's trying to ask. Ask the question in such a way that everyone will be pleased to answer <laughs> in a pedagogical way. If I wanted to figure out the total number number of states within an energy range, what do I need to do? If I use your spectra, uh, your dots. Give me one second. So. So the area under the curve should be the, the number of states? Yeah. Yes. OK, uh, let's thank Whitney for being brave and answering all questions, and uh, Levi for asking pedagogical questions. <laughs> so uh, we are moving on with the program with the next presenter, Aaron Forde, and uh, he will uh, provide additional details on the same subject. So how uh, to convert set of orbital energies into the image. What is behind this uh, procedure, at least from practical side? What is the protocol of converting and uh, how to do it? So, hello, I'm Aaron Forty, and I'll be talking to you about how you do use NewPlot to graph numerical data that we generate. So what is NewPlot? Simply, it is a command line driven program that can be used to plot functions or data. And then these are a couple of nice graphs that I pulled from the new plot home site that kind of show the capabilities that it has. So just as a general overview for how it works, say we have some sort of data file. And as you can see, we have three columns of data. So to plot the data, we use the open new plot by just typing it in. And then we tell it to plot that uh, that file, which is force.dat. And then these one, two specify the row, the number of the columns. So this is saying using this row as your uh, independent variable, and then row two or column two as your dependent variable. And then it does it again, so you get two lines on your graph. And then there are a bunch of other commands that you can be used to kind of customize your graph. To give uh, your x and y axis labels like you should any graph. And then give it range, and you can use log axis. And then the possibilities are pretty much endless. It just depends on what you're trying to do to plot. And then so, so if you're going to be generating many plots of the same type, it's it's kind of tedious just to keep doing it repetitively. So what you can do is you can make a script that you just tell new plot to call, and it'll just run through everything and plot it for you right away. So on the left side, this is just a script that I pulled from this tutorial website from Duke. And it sets a scale, it sets x, y axis, gives it a title. And then to call this, you just use, open up a new plot in the command line. You just tell it to, you just call the file. And then it gives some sort of output file that you can open. And you get a nice little graph pretty quickly. So for our purposes, density of states, 
there's a pretty common chart that we want to look at to get useful data from our system. So picking up from where Whitney left off, we already used the Perl script to extract the density of state's data from the log file. And then we have to make sure that we rename that file as dos.log. And that will be specified in a second why we have to do that. So in the command line, we type new plot so that we're running new plot. Then we tell it where to look so it's located in the bin in the cluster. And then we tell it which file to look for, which is new prog underscore dos underscore shouts. And then this is a script that it is pulling from, and it's all five lines. And then the important things to look for is line two. It's set out that tells us the output file. And then DOS Geo 9, so we're going to get a postscript file. And then we tell it to plot dos.log. So that's why we have to rename everything dos.log. Because if you it's not name that, it's not going to, it doesn't know what file we're trying to go after. So now if we recheck our directory, we should have a DOS underscore GO9 postscript file. And postscript file, we don't really know how to open that with a lot of programs or common programs that we use. So we have to convert it to a PDF, which you can just do PS2 PDF write, and then the name of the file. And then after you do that, if you recheck your directory, you'll have a PDF file. You can download that on your local computer. And then you can open it up, and we have a nice little density of states file. And so in conclusion, NewPlot is a free software that we can use to plot data. We can do 2D graphs, 3D graphs. We can write scripts to make, to make it an efficient process to generate our charts, and we can do it in a quick and a convenient way. OK, let's uh, thank Alan for the presentation. And any technical or maybe philosophical or scientific questions you wanted to ask him or ask anyone about density of states? So, first question, can you run this just straight command line without actually entering in a uh, like new plot script to do it all? Like you can open up a new plot shell type thing? Yeah. If you just type a new plot, will it open up the program to run this? Uh, yeah, if you have it on the cluster, it's locally downloaded on there, so you just have to call new plot. And then it'll run it, but if you wanted to, like if, if you didn't have it on your local computer, you'd have to download software first. Well, I guess, because my second question is, I mean, is there a way that if you run interactively, is there a visual tool that will pop up that uh, you can run off the cluster? As far as I know, it's just command line driven. There's no graphical interface. Uh, let me contribute to the discussion. The uh, GNU plot software that uh, Aaron has uh, introduced, does have opportunity to do plots. Um, in, if you look through the script, can you uh, bring it up? Uh, this one? Yes. So it does have the uh, set term post, which means uh, the output of this uh, command is established as postscript file. But you can type set term JPEG or set term X11, which means if you bring everything to the screen. Or if you do not have graphical connection, you can tell set terminal dump, which means use approximate representation uh, of text window as a graphic. And then with the asterisks and points, it will uh, draw a very ugly picture, but you can. Uh, see what it is. <laughs> okay? So there is a way to generate dumb images. Uh, more questions to Aaron. In the... I have one. <laughs> Can you navigate to the image? And uh, the individual orbitals are represented by peaks with non-zero width. Which physical mechanisms are responsible for this width, or it is completely abstract? Is there any mechanisms that contribute to width of uh, this individual peak? I believe it's just you can like, convolute it with a, a Gaussian just to make it look nice or make it stand out more. But uh, is there anything behind it? Is there any? What, um, the width of this Gaussian, where, how do we select it? Do we just 
blind we repeat what was provided originally or we can modify and make it uh, wider or thinner. Request uh, help from the audience if someone wants to contribute. Vibration, rotation, they all oh, just have the, yes. little contributions. Thermal motion of complementary degrees right. of freedom. Uh, more questions to Aaron? Please. What if you want to compare the Homo Lumo gap of different species? So, like we in the lab, we did uh, different alkene alkenes. Mm -hmm. What if you want to compare the gap between having one, two, three, four, five? And just kind of overlay them all. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Um, Is there a way to do that? Um, not with the script that we use, that we generally use. For this, you'd have to. Well, you have to, well, it kind of depends how you do it. You can put all the files that you want in the same directory, and then write a script that calls all those to plot them. But what what about the energies? Because they won't line up. Because the script that we have, depending on if you say one two, I think if you do. Two four or four two, you get it takes the homo lumo divide gets the energy difference, sets it in half, and then that is zero. So like your Fermi energy is zero, and then you can get the difference. Is do you know if this script does that as well? So like you change one two to two different indexes, if you could get that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what each column okay. in the file represents. If you're not sure and you do not want to fight back with demanding definitions, you're going to probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's <Okay>. possible. <laughs> <laughs> there are heroes on the internet who have probably already done this. Now it's in the script. Uh, OK. Let's uh, thank Aaron for and uh, we have two more presentations in the remaining 15 minutes, which seems reasonable. So the number nine is by Thess Adrian, who will show most beautiful part of this uh, chapter. He will show how to go to visual representations of molecular orbitals in space. And um, he will tell his own vision of this uh, problematics. For yours. All right, so we've been talking about molecular orbitals a whole bunch. Let's look at them. I mean, get nice pictures in your textbook of atomic orbitals. So what we want to do is we want to visualize molecular <laughs> orbitals. Again, um, molecular orbitals are linear combinations of atomic orbitals, but they have to have the same symmetry, which um, Zach helpfully discussed. Um, and the loudness, so how much they overlap, depend, or determines how much they contribute to each molecular orbital. Um, and very basically, they can either be constructive, where your wave functions add together, or they can be destructive, where your wave functions actually subtract from each other. And um, you can see here the C, al C alpha and C beta, that's supposed to be C beta, um, they are uh, your cofactors for how much they over, or how much they contribute to each molecular orbital. So, um, construction of your molecular orbital files. So, we got a check file out when we run the calculations. You need to change that to a F check file. So you use this command form check. Um, I did O2 because it's a very simple molecule. Um, and I have a check file. And then I tell it the output is a F check file. And um, you get some stuff going on here that tells you, hey, we worked. And then you take that F check file and make it a cube gen file. Now, before you do that, you need to go into your log file, look at where your homo is and your lumo is, because, or what molecular orbital you want to plot, because in cube gen, you put the cube gen, um, uh, which will generate a cube file. You put that command, then you put O for orbital, because we want molecular orbitals. Um, then you go MO equals, and in this case, I wanted eight because that was the homo for this molecule, the form check file, and then your output. So I called it mo8.cube. Um, but you can, instead of just using an eight, you can use any number 
that there is an orbital for, you can use HOMO or you can use LUMO, and that will, um, so then you actually don't even need to know which one it is, you just tell it HOMO and it gives you the HOMO. Out. So just plotting it, um, we use Gaussian, it's pretty easy to use, you open it up, um, you open your file with the cube extension, and then you go to surfaces and contours and the results, and you get this sweet pop-up box here, and you tell it that you want a new surface, and you can modify your ISO value here um, to tell it, do we want a higher probability or a lower probability? The higher number you put in here, the smaller they get. So if I wanted to, I could plot you know, very, very small, very, very tight, which is the highest probability area. Or you can huge if you want you know, to fill up your entire screen with green and red bubbles. So modifying um, for open shell configurations is a little bit different. Um, and it was hinted at earlier. Um, but when we run the Hartree Fock calculation, you have to tell it what the spin actually is. In this case, I was doing O2. As you know, O2 is ground state triplet because it has two unpaired electrons. So I had to put it into the triplet state. And I actually ran LAN um, DZ on it. Uh, here's the molecular orbital configuration. This is calculated from group theory. Um, so it's mathematically rigorous. And you can see the two unpaired electrons. Let's see how well they actually, or how well it actually goes in um, calculations. And so the alpha here is all of the up electrons, and the beta is all of the down spin electrons. And as you can see, my occupied orbitals, there's two more in the up, and where we don't have those occupied orbitals for the down spin, which is what we want. Um, but there is a little bit of problem because, as you can see here, these are supposed to be, according to our, or the previous, they're supposed to be equal to these two right here. So HOMO minus two should be equal to the HOMO of the downspin, and it's not. So there's a little bit of um, calculation error in there. Um, oh, and so when you do the cube gen for these, you need to change, or in front of MOs, you need to tell it you want the alpha or the beta. You have to put a little A or a B. Say, I want alpha or I want beta. Tell it which one you want. And here's the result of that. Here's the alphas and here's the betas. So this is the highest and this is the lowest. So get cool pictures. OK, let's uh, stand test. And uh, presentation is open for discussion. Anything you wanted to specify about? So you're talking about ISO values. And you're saying that the small ISO value, the higher probability the visual represents the localization, right? The, the higher the ISO value, the smaller the spheres. Or the smaller, the tighter it is to the atoms. So is there a correlation with like um, confidence values? Um, from my understanding, yes. That I from what I under, or read and understood was the higher the value, the higher the probability it's in there. Or that's where the electron is at. Okay. And it's not like there's a direct, like say if it's 0.4, like 0.04, it's a 96%. I mean, it's, there's not no direct. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I don't know. Probably needs to take orbital square density for, for analysis of probability. And those are real part of uh, amplitude of probability. Sorry for oh, that's, that's all right. Thoughts. More questions to Seth? Uh, I do have one. So based on your calculations, you uh, show that the ground state of oxygen is triplet. Yes. Um, does it mean that one can pick a drop of liquid oxygen with a magnet or not? Um, liquid oxygen should be um, magnetic, yeah. So you can, uh, instead of scoop, you can pick liquid oxygen with a uh, magnet. I wouldn't. Liquid oxygen is <laughs> <explosive. laughs> um, If Theoretically, yeah. OK, OK, good. Um, more questions? If not, thanks, Tess, once again.
in the remaining few minutes, we have the presentation number 10 by Levi Bistrom, who will present his uh, understanding of possibility to analyze charge distribution in a molecule based on Gaussian heart focal equations from different aspects, from numbers to uh, visual distributions. Floor is yours. So, this is. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about Mulek and charge. Um, and how do we get Mulek and charge in our keywords? We actually don't need to specify with Mulekin, they automatically calculate. So if you see, I don't have any pop in here, which pop is for a population of uh, uh, orbitals. So when I use the GUI, go, uh, um, Gauss view, you can right click and then go down to results, charge distribution, you, it should say Mulekin. You can choose different things like have a symmetrical range. So for this one, I go from point, negative 0.7 to positive 0.7. And we can see that the outside is a bit more, less negative or positive, and the core has more electron density. And you can also look at the dipole. So if you click show dipole, it will show wherever it is pointing. Um, if you want to do it in like an algorithm and you want to automatically pull out, do th things to it, you can do grep minus A, number plus one, Mulekin charges, your file, tail, number minus uh, plus two. The reason why you have these numbers is if it's an optimization, it does it twice, so the initial and final. So then for my system, I have 66, so then I do 67 and 68, and then it gives the atoms and then the Mulekin charge. So then you can, if you know which atoms are for your core, you can average that, you can do different things um, with it, and that can be helpful. So another one which is more precise is uh, natural bond orbital, MBO. And here you have to say pop equals MBO. And you can see the difference between Mulekin and MBO is MBO gets a more accurate number. So these are cadmium and selenium, so they should be 2 plus and 2 minus, but they aren't. The maximum is about negative 1 and uh, negative 3 fourths, and that's due to the basis set not being a full basis set with the approximations we have, they do not always converge. And these are taking the d uh, density of the electron and getting a sphere and integrating in that sphere to figure out the electrons around your ion. And bond orbital does more where the bond is, Mulekin is just around a, a sphere. So electron potential, when you do uh, MBOs, uh, you can open them in JMOL, and you can go to surfaces, and there are two different ways you can do it. You can visualize it with the bigger one, or the uh, bigger values, or smaller ones. So we can see here that these are more red, and it's a bit easier to see than this one, because it's pretty much all just blue. So I personally like this one. Um, total uh, density, so similar to the last presentation, to get the total density of the electrons, we generate a cube, but instead of MOs, we do density, and then there's different keywords you can do, and then when you visualize it, you get an electron cloud around your molecule, and I think that's it. Okay, let's thank Levi for being quick and the schedule. Any questions about uh, charge analysis? I have a semantic question. Yes. So the molecule or Mulekin? <laughs> Whatever you prefer. No, no, no. no. He, his, the question was which specific molecule did you use as an illustration for your presentation? Th this? This is a quantum dot. So it's not molecule or Mulekin. 
That wasn't my question, but okay, that works too. <laughs> so this is just a quantum dot. I had them. I didn't want to recalculate stuff, so I just pulled them open. More questions? Uh, I do have one. Yes. So uh, what is molecular orbital? It's a linear combination of atomic orbitals. With some specific expansion yes. coefficients. What is the connection point? Is there a connection? What is the connection between expansion coefficients of molecular orbital in basis of atomic orbitals and Mulliken charge uh, analysis on specific atom? I, I would say that there would be a connection because if you have a high uh, coefficient on a specific atom, then that one electron around it should be attached to that atom, where if you have a very small percentage, then that does not really correlate to around the atom. So probably you need to take absolute value squared and sum over all occupied. Yes. And this will correlate to your charge on the atom. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, last chance to ask questions to Levi. Pay back for him giving someone a hard time. Yes, <laughs> yes. What is Mulliken? What is Mulliken? Um, <laughs> that is a person, I believe. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know who Mulliken or what Mulliken is. Is it a person? It is yeah, a person. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so what does the Mulliken charge mean? Like? What do you mean by what does it mean? Definition. Yeah. What is the definition of Mulliken charge? The Mulliken charge? It is the electron cloud around the atom or ion or nuclei and if you had a complete basis set it should converge to the total number attributed to that atom does that kind of answer your question i honestly don't know the answer so are you happy with the answer <laughs> <laughs> So what if, if you got a plus charge in any atom school, like you got a plus, then what does that mean? Then? I would believe that the nuclear charge is greater than the electron density. So that number is not electron cloud. So total charge around that area. Does anyone want to torture Levi further or already is sufficient? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if no, let's thank Levi uh, for asking questions and answering questions. So we have, we did went through uh, several subjects. Uh, I would say very successful. I believe that the presentations by your classmates help you to master your skills in running this uh, software because you did hard work uh, in preparing there is no homework and you get a substantial amount of points towards your final grade and from this uh, minute you are entitled uh, certified experts in running gaussian software well let me thank all presenters uh, and uh, the being um, completed. So let me announce the adjournment.